So in this stage, we're going to take a closer look at this block. But before diving in, let's take a moment to head over to our collab and set things up there. First, a few keynotes. The C3K2 block is specifically designed for hierarchical feature processing. Unlike the earlier C3K2 blocks, which use a single bottleneck module, this one incorporates nested bottleneck blocks within a secondary C3K structure. This unique setup refines critical patterns in focused subsets, then recombines them to enhance feature diversity and structural richness. As a result, the network captures both detailed and broader patterns more efficiently. Personally, I find it helpful to visualize this and we'll do that shortly to build a clearer understanding and intuition about what's really happening. Before we dive in, I think it's important to explore how this block differs from the previous one. To do this, we'll use the arguments for this stage in a similar way to what we've done before. The key difference here is that this block has C3K set to true. At initialization, it transitions into the C3K class. Notice the value 2 assigned to n. This represents the number of bottleneck blocks within this structure. The C3K class inherits from the C3 class, which initializes CV1, CV2, CV3, and M. However, the M module is overwritten shortly after. Then, back in the C3K class, we redefine M to consist of two bottleneck blocks. If you're interested, we can run this code section to see it in action, but now let's move on to the exciting part dynamically visualizing this block and its operations. We begin with an input tensor to the M6 module of shape 1 by 128 by 30 by 40. First, the CV1 from C2F processes the input, keeping the shape the same. The tensor is then split into two parts, Y0 and Y1. Up to this point, it follows the same pattern as the other C3K2 blocks. However, here's where things start to differ. Y1 enters the nested C3K block, which contains a C3 block. Inside C3, both CV1 and CV2 reduce the channels to 32. The output of CV1 feeds into two bottleneck blocks, refining features while maintaining the shape. This output is concatenated with the output of CV2, resulting in 64 features, followed by one last CV3 to exit the C3 block. Back in C2F, the output from C3 becomes Y2. All parts, Y0, Y1, and Y2 are concatenated, forming a tensor with 192 channels. The final step applies a CV2 layer, reducing the channels back to 128. This sequence balances feature refinement and computational efficiency, enhancing diversity while preserving spatial and channel integrity ensuring the output is optimally prepared for the next stage. All right, let's run through the code now and follow along with our module diagram. Here, similar to the other C3K2 modules, we start with a convolution, CV1, and return. Next, we split the resulting tensor into two parts and save them into a list Y corresponding to indices 0 and 1. We then take the last index, Y1, and feed it into the C3K block, which contains a C3. Within the C3 block, the first operation is another CV1 convolution, and we return. The output of this CV1 is then passed into self.m, which consists of two bottleneck blocks. Let's explore those. Inside the bottleneck, we first perform each CV1 convolution and return, followed by CV2 and return again. After that, we add the skip connection, or X, which in our case is Y1. The output of the first bottleneck then becomes the input to the second one. Again, we perform its CV1 convolution and return, followed by CV2 and return. Finally, we add the skip connection before returning to the C3 block to continue. Back in C3, we perform the CV2 convolution and return. Then we concatenate the outputs of the double bottleneck block and CV2 along the channel dimension. This concatenated tensor is then processed through CV3 before returning. With that, we complete the operations of the C3 block and return to C2F. This output is appended to the list Y. Finally, we concatenate everything in Y along the channel dimension and perform one last CV2 convolution to complete the C2F block. With all operations complete for this block, we return to where it was called 
we can then visualize some of the feature maps. But this time we're going to do something a bit different that I think is pretty cool. I want to show you how our feature maps correlate with the original input image, which had dimensions of 480 by 640. I've selected three output features from this stage that represent different learning patterns. Let's start with feature map four. By gradually increasing its opacity, we can observe how it overlaps with our original image. This feature map appears to have learned the edges of the car. It activates around the front fender, the middle where the front door is located, and toward the back in areas like the C-pillar or quarter panel. This could help the network identify key structural elements of the car. Next, let's look at feature map 15. This one activates along the contour of the car, which might assist in determining the dimensions of the bounding box around it. Finally, we have feature map 46. This one is primarily focused on detecting circular patterns, as evident from the strong activations on the car's wheels. When we combine not just these three features, but the full 128 feature maps from this stage, the network can learn a wide range of patterns and details about the image. Now let's tie this back to our input image. Notice that the feature maps at this stage have a grid of 30 by 40 along the height and width. Each grid cell or pixel in these feature maps corresponds to a 16 by 16 pixel area in the original image. Since 480 divided by 30 is 16, and 640 divided by 40 is also 16. If we zoom in, we can visually confirm this. By disabling the image overlay, we can more clearly see where each grid cell starts and ends, and then we can overlay it back. This shows us how the information from the 16 by 16 regions, such as small low-level features like edges, gets aggregated and combined with information from neighboring regions to detect higher level features like the rims or wheels. Pretty amazing if you ask me. With that, I think we're ready to continue our exploration of this architecture. We're going to move quickly through the next two stages since these are familiar modules. At this point, we've doubled the number of feature maps and each feature map now contains 15 by 20 pixels of abstracted data. This C3K2 block marks the final stage before we reach the SPPF module. 